Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here and like what you are listening to or you have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it support the channel, but it reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled true middle of nowhere stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. This happened to me back in college. I was maybe 20 or 21. I'm 27 now, so it was a number of years ago. I had just moved into the trailer my father had bought. It was a little trailer park out in the boonies where my cousin also lived, and the neighbors were all family friends. This occurred in southwest New Mexico. Also, for reference, I've never had a paranormal experience before or since this happened, but I've had people tell me there was something attached to me. Anyway, I was living in this trailer with no electricity. The company hadn't been out yet. But I had water and lanterns, and I liked camping anyway, so whatever. As a poor college student, I had bread and peanut butter, so that's what I had for dinner. I went to bed and fell asleep just fine. I woke up somewhere between 2 and 3 a.m. that night in the most pain I've ever been in. I'm talking 10 out of 10. I was ready to call an ambulance. And there in the corner of my room was this tall, thin, lady. It looked like something was wearing a lady's skin, actually. She had thick curly black hair, which was wet, and was wearing some type of white slip. It just stood there in the corner of my room, staring at me and smiling. It was not natural. The smile was way too wide. While I was writhing in pain on my mattress, I realize now I probably should have been scared witless at this, but I was honestly just irritated. I remember saying, Lady, I'm sick and I don't have time to deal with you. Get lost. Then promptly ran past her to the bathroom and vomited for the next 10 minutes. When I came back to my room, I was fine and this thing had gone. To this day, I'm not sure if it was actually in my room or if I hallucinated the entire thing. What are your thoughts? Has anyone seen anything similar? This happened to a friend of mine while he was deployed in the Middle East. He's a Marine. The country he was deployed to has a tradition of camping in the desert each winter. He said it would be best to avoid mentioning the name because this just happened in December and prefers to keep it confidential. His unit was invited for a sleepover at the camp by one of the companies that do business out there. They went ahead and had dinner, shared some funny stories around the bonfire, etc. Now, it was time for sleep. Apparently, the area they were in was rocky and quite pointy and the only thing between them and the ground was a very thin carpet and their sleeping bags. My friend and another guy couldn't sleep, but they didn't want the locals to think that the big bad marines are a bunch of wussies who can't sleep on the ground, so they didn't complain and just decided to go to the nearest hotel and get back in the morning. The nearest hotel was like 45 minutes away, so my friend said he would lie down in the back seat while the other guy drove. Now, while in the car, my friend opens his eyes to see someone was sitting next to the driver. At first, he thought he picked up a hitchhiker because the one in the passenger seat was wearing local clothing and thought, what the hell is this idiot thinking picking up a stranger at this hour? And just closed his eyes. After about 10 seconds, he was slammed into the front seat as the car suddenly braked and the driver flees the car as soon as humanly possible. He gets out to see what had happened, to see the other guy freaked out of his mind. 
Apparently, this someone suddenly appeared out of nowhere in the passenger seat while he was driving. He was too scared to turn around to it, but could see it clearly out of the corner of his eyes. So he just froze and kept driving until he mustered enough courage to slightly turn and get a better look. That's when the entity groaned, which made him freak out and flee. By the time they went to check on the passenger side, there was nobody, and they were certain that the door did not open. I don't know if the following is related, but they did some asking, and apparently near the area they were camping in are some old prisons carved into the mountains that were used by the British to lock up political prisoners and just left them until they starved to death. I'm very interested to learn what was that and if anyone had similar experiences. This happened 12 years ago when I was 16, and I'm a female. Back then, I lived in a small town where most people lived out in the country. Around 12 a.m. on a Saturday, I'm dropping my friend off after a night of hanging out. This friend lived way out in the country in the middle of nowhere, and to get there you had to take a lot of winning roads with nothing on either side, and not many people traveled on them. There were a few houses, but most of them own a lot of the land, so they were majorly spread out. I always hated dropping her off at night because driving back was always super creepy. Probably because I have seen way too many horror movies to know what can happen out in the middle of nowhere. But it was my turn to drive that night. After dropping her off, I'm being super careful, not only because of my irrational fear, but because of drunks who don't take the curves very well. I turn left on the last small street before I get onto the main road, and this street has two major curves that you have to take slow since they are pretty wide and almost back to back. I'm coming up on the first curve, so I'm slowing down when I see these three people dressed in all black, black sweaters and black pants, walking and blocking the entire lane. It was frustrating at first because I thought they were just teenagers not thinking of the dangers of what they were doing. So I sped up to hurry and pass them in the other lane before a car coming the other direction could hit me. As I'm passing them, I look out my side window to get a glimpse of the idiot teenagers' faces. That's when I noticed all three of them were wearing the same creepy gray skull mask and they all stared at me as I passed them. If it was close to Halloween, I would have passed it off as someone getting in the spirit of Halloween. But it was around May when this happened. The weird thing about the situation was, it didn't seem like they were trying to run me off the road or cause me harm. They didn't even look behind them when I first pulled up on them. The whole situation was too weird, so I called the police. They called me back pretty soon after and told me they sent someone to the exact location where I had described and said they found nobody walking on the street or even on the side of it. What creeped me out about that is that there's nowhere the three people could have hid at because the street had open land on both sides. There were also no side streets that they could have turned onto to evade the cops. They had to have been picked up by somebody or knew of a good place to hide. Either way, I know what I saw were actual people and not something I made up. I have no idea to this day what those three people were up to, but I told my friend that if she wanted me to drop her off again, it needed to be before dark because I never wanted to find out what their intentions truly were. I used to work as a housekeeper for this company that would assign me to different houses in the area that were hiring. I had this one job at a house that was just a few towns over one night. I was reluctant to go since it was late, but I knew an old back road that would cut the driving time in half. It used to be an old logging road, and there's tons of them here in Oregon that can be handy shortcuts to places. One downside was the road was small, windy, and if you got into a crash, you'd basically be in the middle of nowhere surrounded by forest. 
I'm not sure it was completely legal to drive on either. So anyways, I was driving down this road, groggy and tired, when I felt a small collision on my trunk. I cursed and pulled over to inspect the damage and talked to the driver, who had seemingly come out of nowhere. He pulled up behind me. I got out and walked over to him and asked if he was okay. I was about three feet from the car, and I could see him sitting in there, but he wasn't getting out. It was winter and night, so everything was pitch black, and I could barely see anything, but I knew there was a figure sitting there. It was freezing cold, and I was getting creeped out, so I told him, since there was barely any damage, I was just going to go. As I was heading back to my car, I heard his car door open behind me. I turned around and saw him standing there. He was tall and had on a large black coat and baggy jeans. I stepped towards him and noticed something that made my heart sink. His hands were white-skinned, but his face looked dark. I squinted and realized he was wearing black makeup on his face. This scared me even more because I was thinking he was wearing blackface. And for the record, I'm black and he had followed me out here in the middle of nowhere to do some harm against me. I turned and started for my car when I felt a cold tip of the gun press the back of my head. I was ready to cry at this point, thinking I was going to die alone out here because of my skin color. I ended up trying to reason with him, but I could barely choke out my words, as I told him he didn't have to do this. Something surprising happened, the guy started to cry as well, and just then he jumped into his car and sped off. Maybe I should have tried to see the license plate, but at that moment I just got in my car, drove home, and called my parents. I never ever in my entire life thought I'd narrowly escape from being the victim of what was possibly a hate crime. I'm glad this guy had a change of heart, or whatever you want to call his reasoning for sparing me. So this happened over a year ago. I am from the US but now live in the UK. I thought this kind of thing only happened in Florida where my family still lives as I've had my fair share of creepy encounters there. I like to think I'm a tough old bird who doesn't mind helping out a fellow human being. I was driving home with my dogs from my partner's house as we were still dating at the time. And I had work the next day and needed my work stuff. He lived an hour away, so it was a long drive home, through the rustic English countryside. It was late-ish, but was still a little light as summer lingered about on those lovely long sunsets. As I'm driving, I get a call from my son, who is living in the U.S. Just wanted to pull over and touch base with my son to let him know that I was driving and would catch up with him when I got home. I pull over at the next convenient spot, which happens to be a drive onto someone's farm. I wasn't aware of this until after getting out of my car later. I had vaguely noticed a big barn next to a farmhouse, kind of unkempt and no lights on. It's still a little light out, so nothing overtly odd, I suppose, about no lights on inside the house behind the guy. While I'm talking to my son, both my dogs start to grumble about something. I look up and see a very big, tall and heavy, mid-60s-70s, older man waving at me for help. He had the hood or bonnet of his truck propped open and was sitting on a stool next to it. Since I had a mobile phone, I thought that I would offer to call someone to help him. As soon as I stepped out of my car, he shouted to me to roll up my windows because of my dogs. My babies are about the size of a beagle, and my girl is fiercely protective. So I roll the windows only about halfway up, enough just so they can still poke their heads out, but not down far enough, so it's an easy jump out of the car. Some people are just scared of dogs, right? Even though most farms have working dogs, but okay. As I get to his truck, I offer the phone call. He's old, so maybe doesn't have a cell phone, you know? He says no to the phone call and says he just needs someone to help fill the radiator because my car is overheated. 
So, me being no stranger to a little light auto maintenance, I looked over to see the radiator cap already off. He offered me a full bottle of water with which to perform this top-up. Mind you, the truck was stone cold, and as I got to the radiator, it was already full of water. Pesky alarm bells going off in my head, even louder now. At this point, I said I could call the AA, it's a car recovery service, or the police. He said no thanks again and began to profusely thank me for helping with his truck. He stood up, whoa Nelly, and asked for my address so he could drop me off some sausages. Because, you see, he was a butcher. My alarm bells are screaming louder than ever now. All the while, my dogs are not loudly barking, but you can hear them nervously wolfing from my car in the background. About 20 feet away, maybe? Luckily, he seemed disabled since he was wearing a knee brace and also had a walking stick. I only got close enough to him once to get the water bottle hand off. I stayed at arm's length after that, made my excuses, and immediately walked back to my car. I have never gotten out of anywhere so fast in my life. After recounting the story to my daughter, she said it was a good thing the dogs were with me and that they probably saved me from getting into further trouble. I seriously thought that I might have just met Leatherface's grandfather. Definitely felt like a setup. Who sits outside in the semi-dark like that in the middle of nowhere waiting for some chance help you don't really need to wander by? Super scary creepy. This is, hands down, the most unsettling experience of my life. This happened when I was visiting some family members in Florida. We were having dinner one night when my uncle started telling us silly stories from his youth. He mentioned going to Casadaga with his friends a couple of times and immediately the rest of my family started chiming in with their respective Casadaga stories. Not being a Florida native, I asked them what the hell Casadaga was. My uncle told me that it was a small town not too far away from where they live. Okay, nothing too interesting about that. Then he told me that it had a reputation for being the psychic capital of the world and that he and his friends would go there in high school because there was a rumor that it was haunted. Being a lover of all things creepy and paranormal, I immediately wanted to go. I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. My uncle, being up for anything, agreed to take me. Mind you, we had just finished dinner, so this was at around 9 p.m. My uncle, myself, and two other family members got into his truck and started driving there. After about an hour of driving, we turned onto a narrow gravel road. There was absolutely no lights on this road. This happened during the summer of 2016, when the whole clown craze was going on. So when we found ourselves in complete darkness, in the middle of nowhere. All I could think of was some freak in a clown costume jumping out to scare us. We passed a lot of houses as we were driving, none of which had any lights on. Granted, it was almost 11 p.m. at night at this point, but I found it hard to believe that no one had any lights on in their houses. It definitely added to the eerie atmosphere. We finally made it to the hotel without any clown interference to my delight. It was the only building that had any lights on. For clarification, we weren't planning on staying at the hotel. My uncle just wanted to show me around and maybe talk to the locals a bit. We parked in the tiny parking lot in front of the entrance and got out of the car. I'm not sure what compelled us to do so, but we all left our respective car doors open. We walked up to the hotel and started looking inside. The lights were on, but there was no one inside. I found this odd because we were potential customers and I was expecting someone to come out and greet us. As we were all standing by the entrance, a silver car pulled up to the parking lot. It slowed down in front of us and suddenly a man stuck his head out of the window. You're going to regret this, he yelled and drove off. Not a word was exchanged between my family members and I. Within a split second, we had booked it back to the car. My uncle started driving us back to the highway so that we could get home. At this point, I'm already freaked out, 
So when a black SUV with garbage bags taped over the window started tailing us, I started praying. It was the middle of the night. There were still no lights on the small road we were driving on. And now some madman trying to run us off the road. Every time my uncle would speed up in order to avoid getting rear-ended, the guy in the black SUV would speed up too. We were driving at such an incredible speed that it only took us a couple of minutes to get to the road that connected to the highway. The SUV was still tailgating us at this point. Halfway down the road, I noticed a familiar car parked on the side of the road by a ditch. It was the silver car from before. The driver was pulling something out of the trunk as we were approaching him. Because of the speed at which we were driving, I couldn't see what it was he was getting out clearly. Although I didn't see what was in his trunk, I didn't have a good feeling about it. When we finally got to the end of the road, my uncle was so desperate to get out of there that he ran a red light and turned onto the highway. The black SUV didn't follow us onto the highway. We never really talked about what happened that night, and I had basically forgotten all about it up until today. One night, me and two friends were all walking around at night in the field around a small town in Michigan. Our destination was a junkyard tucked away behind several fields, home to rusted out cars, semi-trailers, farm equipment, etc. We were cutting through the fields to avoid the trigger-happy farmers that live around there, just about there, and we were foiled by a stream too wide to leap. It was late autumn, and wet feet would be uncomfortable, so we backtracked into the adjacent field. From our corner of the field, there was a tree line that ran east to west, and southward, the land rose into a large hill. We stood for a moment, discussing our options, when my eyes were drawn to a large white boulder, seeming to glow a bit in the moonlight. It was already around 75 yards away, and I was idly staring at it when it moved. It unfolded, standing up, a 10 to 12 foot bipedal being, skeletal thin, pure white with long limbs. For the space of a second, it looked at us, and then it took off. I think it was running, but it may have been gliding or flying. Honestly, I'm unsure. It crossed the field, up over the mountain, a distance of probably a hundred yards, in two to three seconds, in complete silence, and was gone. Only two of the three of us saw it, and after a few minutes of incoherent gibbering, we tried to rationalize, explain, figure out what the hell it was we saw, and we decided it must be an alien. A year later, I was at a party, and the subject of aliens came up. I say, yo, I've seen an alien. And everyone says, <laughs> yeah, right. Let me guess, in Saranok, right? I confirm. We exchange mutual looks of awe, and he directs me to this Eric fellow who grew up in said town. Eric tells me that he has seen strange things there his whole life. Lights in the sky, you know, the works. But no humanoid beings. Fast forward another year and a half or so, and I got a phone call from an acquaintance who was sitting at work when he noticed a girl staring at him strangely. She eventually walks up to him and says, I feel like I need to talk to you. She proceeds to tell him that her friend's dad is the head of a vampire clan in a town near Saranok. My friend remembers my story about weird things in that area and asks her if she knows anything about that place. She gets very defensive and eventually reveals that Saranok is a breeding ground for dragons. Yeah, okay. To this day, I'm not certain if I saw a dragon, an alien, or a freaking vampire, but I did a bit of poking around and I heard from a girl that lived there as a kid that she had seen random 15-foot scorch marks on roadsides and in the middle of the field. Now, call me crazy, but what do you think we saw that day?
This is one of my favorite stories to tell. It describes my childhood, so I decided to share with you. It was 2009. I'm in high school and I'm a male. English is not my first language, so forgive me if anything sounds weird. I live on an island where most people leave near the coast, but my childhood house is deep in the mountains. Imagine a house in the woods, but at the very top of a mountain. The house is surrounded by thick mist every night, like in the bad horror movies, and the woods around it start less than two feet from the outer walls of the house. Our closest neighbor is about a 15-minute drive, and five minutes away, there's an abandoned house. I think the house belonged to a distant relative, but it was abandoned more than 40 years ago. There's no street lights, and there's all kinds of animals roaming the area. This is important to the story, because even though you couldn't see a group of 10 people hiding one meter away from you in the woods, you could hear absolutely everything up to a couple kilometers away. If we saw car lights or heard a car approaching, me and my family would turn off all the lights and hide. Don't know why, shy, antisocial, you name it. I think that's enough to set the story up but I'll add some details that might be important. My house is small and impoverished, but our family car was a good one. I don't know much about cars, but my dad always said that without a really good car, we wouldn't be able to go up and down the mountain we lived on. Also, there's currently eight people inside our house around 11 p.m. So, I'm at the dining table enjoying some cereal while I watch some anime having the time of my life. The lights in the house were on, so nothing could be seen in the dark outside. There's a window in front of me that gives to the front entrance of the house and the only road. Something calls my attention, but I don't see or hear anything. I think I see a human silhouette outside, but it doesn't move, so I just ignore it as some effect of the lights in the house and my own reflection. More anime, more cereal. I feel something moving at the other side of that window, and this time the silhouette is waving at me. I felt my heart jump out of my chest, and I instantly froze. The person outside waves at me, as if trying for nobody else in the house to notice him. After maybe 10 seconds in which I'm just looking at him with a spoon halfway hanging out of my mouth, he decides to call. Hello, uh, I need help. My parents hear him and approach the window, which made me sure I wasn't looking at a ghost. Amazing news, I know. The man outside starts telling a story about how he got his car stolen at gunpoint and really needs help. My parents are surprised that nobody heard his footsteps or a car or anything, so they whisper their theories amongst themselves. For the mysterious guy's story to be true, he had to have been mugged more than a mile away, got his car stolen, and then walked for half an hour in the dark through the woods, following the dim light of our house. My parents still decide to believe him, and they offer calling the police. Our visitor begs to say the stupidest thing he could have. Don't call the police. Uh, I don't have a gun. My parents stay silent for a while. The guy outside knows he messed up, but proceeds to make his request. Can I get a ride downtown? My dad nervously chuckles and gives him an excuse. He mentions the time, the fact that he felt the guy was lying, and that... He had already called the police, which was a lie, by the way. This is when my favorite part of the story begins. I stand up from the table, shaking. I go to a closet, and even though I can't see the guy's face, I know he's following my actions. I get two machetes that are half my size and run to another room. I was terrified, and looking back, I probably took away the only weapons my parents could have used to protect themselves in case of an altercation. I open a door to the room where me and my siblings sleep, and they were watching some silly show. 
probably something stupid like Hannah Montana or iCarly. And their hyena laughter came out. My sisters are loud, and my younger brothers are four years old, seven years old, and nine years old. So their laughs are angelical by day and demonic by night, if you know what I mean. I signal at them to shut up, and they do so. Joining me and my parents in our fear. We hear in silence as the guy says, It's okay if you can't help me. I'll go to the next house. My dad then says, There is no next house. You should wait for the police here. I, I, I don't need the police. <laughs> I'm good. This goes back and forth. The guy is now in good shape to walk an hour down the mountain to reach downtown. My dad offers a rusty metal tricycle from our porch so that he can go downtown as a joke. The guy accepts this offer and grabs the tricycle. I assume he just wanted to leave with something. This tricycle is 20 years old and it definitely does not work. We hear the screeching of the tricycle for a couple of seconds as the stranger struggled to be able to ride it. And then it stopped, not too far away from our house. It seemed like he stopped and we didn't hear any footsteps that indicated the guy had left. After trying to identify if he was still on site, to no avast, my dad calls the police. We wait in silence, looking at the road from the front windows. Fifteen minutes later, the police get here. Amazing time back home, heroic even. And as soon as the red and blue lights show up, they illuminate the entire road up to the abandoned house. The tricycle is still in the road, not too far away. The police claim not seeing anyone on the road. Only one road on the mountain. If the guy kept on walking, they would have seen him. So they just took a look at the woods with a flashlight and called it a day. The cops were really freaked out by the eerie look of our house and did not stay more than five minutes. Nothing else happened that night. I slept with two machetes under my pillow, which I remember angered one of my sisters. We have no idea who that person was. No carjackings were reported the next day. And even though a lot of weird things happened around my house, we never saw this guy again. It's pretty obvious he was trying to steal our family's car, but there were a few things we could never understand. Where the hell did he come from? Where the hell did he go? If his story was true, he had the worst luck in the world. I think the situation was interesting because I think about his point of view and our horror night turns a bit comical. I mean, imagine this. You go rob a house. Turns out the people inside speak calmly. I don't know how much criminals encounter this as they try to intimidate or deceive. There's a scrawny, seemingly mute kid that tries to be sneaky in grabbing some machetes and then hides in the darkness of the house. And there's child's laughter coming from the non-visible rooms from the house. He could see the doors, but the inside of the rooms would be geometrically impossible to look into from the windows. I think we were lucky to out-creep the creep that night. I don't see any other reason for the guy to back out from his plans. The guy clearly had a gun and bad intentions, not to mention his ability to ninja walk through a forest where we even hear wildcats walking around. Also, no neighbors to witness or hear anything. I'm sure some other reason would have told the story better, but I gave it a shot. I guess the lesson to be learned here is don't let strangers in your house after dark. Growing up, I was always at my grandma's house. My childhood featured a parent with substance abuse issues, and going to my grandma's house was the best. I had friends there, and she lived in a really nice suburb with tons of other kids my age. I made really good friends with a neighbor who had woods in his backyard. Let's call him Mike for the sake of this story. 
We'd often take little lunches packed by my grandma and go out into the woods to eat them and admire creeks and birds, collect pebbles and stuff. You know, the stuff kids do. This was harmless, and you could usually always see the backs of houses when you went into the woods. I remember one day we made a pack, mine was in a grocery bag, and planned to venture out further than we had ever been before. You know how you have limitless energy when you're little and low back pain hasn't set in yet from sitting at a desk for most of your adult life? You literally could walk for hours and probably many miles and not even notice and eat a crappy PB&J and a can of Coke and be totally rejuvenated. Yeah, that was us. So, we walked further than ever. We slid down a hill. I remember being really scared of this and hilariously am still majorly scared to fall when hiking. I got a little scuffed up nothing major. Mike was slightly older than me, so I wanted to seem tough and just walk it off. We walked deep into the woods, and I remember being just slightly creeped out, but not enough to protest. I wanted to explore too. This is in western Pennsylvania, I should add. We weren't in the rural parts of my state, but some of the suburbs do intersect with trails and nature preserves which can go on for acres and acres. We came upon a tent in the middle of freaking nowhere. Not a marked camping area, just like in the middle of nothing. I remember being terrified. My grandma gave me a lot of freedom because I was a pretty responsible kid, and it was also the 90s. Aside from needing to be home by streetlights every night, Stranger danger was something she drilled into my head. This set off the internal stranger danger alarm loudly, but at this point, I was too afraid to leave Mike's side. So we approached the tent, even though everything inside of me is singing to get the fuck out of there. Mike goes up to it, and I tentatively follow him. At first, I thought someone was just camping, but it looked more permanent than that. Anyway, there's a fire that's out, but still smoking like it had been doused. There were bones everywhere. Skulls, mostly. Tiny ones, which, to my untrained eye, just looked like animal bones. There were also little pits of animals covered in what looked like paint and symbols. My adrenaline kicked me right in the ass, and I ran. Mike ran, too. We ran so far and so fast that we fell down the side of the hill, and we ended up emerging from the woods on the other end of a shooting range. The men firing were screaming at us to leave. Understandably, how stupid we were. I was so scared of that tent that I didn't even process the real danger, which was the shooting range. We definitely could have died very tragically there. So... Looking back on this memory, I'm wondering, was this something nefarious? Or could that have been a harmless nomad living in the woods? If they were living there, maybe the bones were from small game they had to eat to live. But the pelts with symbols are throwing me. I don't know. This is a weird memory that I can still see clearly to date. I don't know. What do you think? So, about five years ago, I set out to travel the world. Being straight out of college had left me in debt, ever more desperate for any job I was overqualified for and generally depressed. I felt isolated and alone in my small town in Washington and found the only way to get out, travel. My high school buddy suggested I look into Wolfig and volunteering as a way to travel cheap. And so I did. The way it works is quite simple. You work for around 25 hours a week on some farm for food and housing. The draw is that, since the community of cheap-ass travelers is quite big, it is a great way to meet new people, 
get outside of your comfort zone and just let yourself live and figure life out. Fast forward eight months and I am a seasoned cow shit shoveler. I started out in Washington, Oregon and went south to California. There I was able to make some extra money. I was paid under the table for some extra work and was now faced with a decision. Where to go in the world? The excitement of being able to purchase a ticket to almost anywhere in the world got the best of me. And on the advice of my dumbass hippie volunteering partner, I chose it at random. I went to a randomizer website and clicked the country button. Georgia. The country of Georgia. To say I didn't know anything about it was an understatement. But the fear of the unknown made it exciting and exotic somehow. And so I did it. I purchased a ticket and started browsing for a farm that could host me. There were a few options, but most were remote and hadn't even had an internet connection. I messaged every single one because few ever respond and got a response from one farm on top of a mountain. The picture showed a traditional Georgian stone house with a large garden out in the back. A family with several cheerful children, grandparents having dinner, animals. It seemed warm and inviting. The description was written in good English, and the requirements for work seemed reasonable. I was excited. As I flew into Tbilisi, the capital, I followed the directions that they had sent me to locate the farm, which wasn't an easy task. Few in Georgia speak English. The roads are fucked since few have been maintenance. Since the fall of the Soviet Union and the country is generally poor. It took me around 20 hours of Soviet buses and taxis, weird serpentine roads and paths to get to that deserted blue pen on my map. It was a dirt path leading up a steep hill into a national park up in the north of the country. There was nothing for miles on end but trees and their silence. As I got up that hill, I saw the house about half a mile away on an even steeper hill surrounded by trees. From that viewpoint, it seemed abandoned, overgrown, brown, and dreary. As I walked past the gate, Gary, the apparent owner, approached me. He was a heavy, small, middle-aged guy with a big smile on his face. He shook my hand and in broken English started to show me around. He also smelled of booze. As he was showing me around, I noticed that there wasn't anyone there but us. I asked about his wife and kids and he brushed that aside and said something to the extent of, they're away right now. By this point, I am pretty creeped out. From browsing around, it was apparent that the farm was in deep decline. Apple trees and crops were dying. The roof of the small barn was caved in. The house itself was full of trash and smelled of mold. It was obvious that Geary was going through a rough patch, but I wasn't going to turn around and just leave in the middle of nowhere without a plan, having not slept for the past 36 hours. It was evening, and after feeding me well and trying as best as he could to hold a conversation in English, Geary showed me my room on the second floor, and I went to sleep. I almost immediately blacked out from the exhaustion and stress, and would have slept for ten hours if I wasn't awoken by a strange noise in the middle of the night. It sounded like something metallic and heavy was being dragged across the wooden floor. In that sleepy in-between state, I listened to it for a few minutes, thought nothing of it, and went back to sleep once it stopped. In the morning, Gary, now sober and grumpy, asked me to repair some of the windows and doors in the house, as he himself planned to go and fetch some components in a nearby village. Again, I got this weird feeling creeping down my spine. Something wasn't right here. He didn't maintain eye contact and was evasive. There was no cell reception, no internet. Once he left, 
I checked around the house to get a general idea of the place, and it became apparent that the place was hardly ever lived in. Like one of those abandoned houses, there was broken furniture, newspapers, and old photos on the floor, a shattered mirror. I took my phone and looked through the saved listing again. The photos did not match either the backyard, the garden, or the walls. Geary wasn't in any of them. It was a completely different house. Now, by this point, I am full-blown panicking. I pack my shit and start to leave when I see a group of three men going up the first hill. There aren't any other paths I can take. So I go behind the house and rush down this hill into the forest. After some time, I stop and listen. I hear them in the house. They're clearly looking for me. Afraid of making any noise, I remain still, hidden behind a bush. I don't know how long I waited, but they were persistent. At some point, I hear them leave, so I count until some large number and proceed back into the house and path, and once I find it's all clear, I book it the hell out of there. I've never ran this fast in my life, but I am still in the middle of fucking nowhere. No traffic, no public transport. I reached a paved road and started walking in the general direction from where I remember coming. Hours go by, and finally, a car drives by and stops. Now, in a horror movie, this would have been Geary and his friends, but this was actually a really nice Russian family that gave me a ride to town. The listing disappeared from the website in a few days after I left, and I haven't heard from Geary since. I've yet to make sense of that experience. I have traveled since and volunteered too. Some people, once they hear this story, laugh and say that the guy was coming over with a couple of his friends from the village to have a chat over a few beers. Some say he was bound to kidnap and kill me, but I always trust my gut feeling. Something was really not right. So, Gary, I hope I never run into you ever again. I had just turned 21 and frequented the bars regularly. In hindsight, I probably spent too much time drinking with my friends. I didn't have a car or a cell phone, and I lived on the outskirts of town. It was a 45-minute walk downtown. The town I live in is generally a very safe place. It is a wealthy, well-to-do, white-bred community. So walking home alone at night after drinking was nothing that bothered me other than the actual walking. It was a Tuesday night, and that meant pints were cheap. So I wouldn't say I was completely wasted, but I certainly was more than tipsy. Instead of walking home along the sidewalk, where I feared I'd be picked up by the police for being drunk in public, I decided to take the bike path that ran along the train tracks. This meant the walk would take longer, but much safer, and less likely I'd run into any sort of trouble. Or so I thought. The bike path was not very lit, and knowing what I know now, I should have been a lot more nervous about walking alone in the complete darkness at 2 in the morning. Like I said, I had just turned 21 and was certainly an arrogant young male who was thinking about women and not minding my surroundings. I had taken this path many nights, and coming across anybody else was rare. If I did, perchance, come across somebody this late at night, most of the time it was just another drunk college student who had the same thoughts as me. Either that or they were homeless. But if so, I'd say they were all harmless. So this night, as I'm walking, I noticed further down the path was somebody walking towards me. He wore a large hiking backpack and had his hoodie pulled over his head. It was so dark I couldn't see their face. I could really only just barely make out their outline. This person's gait unquestionably revealed him to be a male, who I figured was probably just a transient. It was odd to see somebody walking towards downtown at two in the morning. When I got really close to him and we were about to cross paths, 
This person just stopped dead in his tracks and I could tell he was staring at me because his head just followed me as I walked by. It creeped me out a bit and I certainly felt like that was a bit odd. As I continued to walk, shrugging at the situation, I just didn't feel right. Something in my gut made me feel wrong. I stopped and turned around to see this person still staring at me. What? I asked him as I stopped walking and remained to stare back at him. That's when he hissed at me, like a snake, a long, vicious-sounding hiss that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I had hoped he was just being weird or perhaps was on meth or something. I nervously laughed a bit and said, <laughs> uh, okay, and continued to walk on. I made it a few more steps and turned to look back. He somehow managed to get closer to me without making a sound. He stood completely still. I figured perhaps I was just drunk and imagining things. I turned back around and walked, taking a few more steps. I turned around once more. Now, I knew he was closer. I couldn't believe I couldn't hear him approaching behind me. What unsettled me even more was how every time I turned around, he'd managed to stop and stand completely still. Uh, are you following me, buddy? Once again, he let out this creepy hiss, just staring at me. Now, I was freaked out and had this strange sensation that I was some sort of prey. Ugh. Hey, fuck you, man, I now yelled. In hindsight, this was a bad idea, but because I already felt like I was some sort of target, and the last thing I should have been wanting to do is provoke this sick, twisted bastard. I started backing away at this point, not taking my eyes off of him. He just stood there hissing. The hisses were getting longer, louder, and more malice was apparent in him. As he started to hiss louder and louder, he began to engage in some sort of pursuit. At first, they were basic steps, but the further I backed away, the more he sped up, taking bigger steps towards me. I said, fuck this, to myself. I'm getting out of here. I noped it out of there and began into a full-fledged run. He started running after me. I could hear his heavy boots gaining on me, hissing like a cat growling like a dog. I feel his spit hitting me in the back of my neck. Get away from me, I yelled. I'll admit, I might have pissed myself I was so scared. All I could think to do was run as fast as I could and to get inside of my house as quickly as possible. I've always been a very fast runner, but this guy was much taller than me, and his legs were really long, so he was really cutting down the distance between me and him. I managed to keep a good five feet between us, though checking back behind me as I saw his arms reaching out in an attempt to grab me. I finally made it out of the bike path and onto the crossing sidewalk of the street that was lit up by street lamps and a few passing cars. I was so relieved to finally make it back to civilization. There was a gas station over by my house and I thought I'd run to safety of its inside only to see that the light had been shut off and the doors were closed. It was closed. I had to make it to my house. As I got closer to my house, I could see my roommate's lights on through the window. Chris, I shouted. Chris, open the door. Open the door. I'm impressed I yelled loud enough that he actually heard me. I saw the front door of my house open up and my roommate standing at the doorway looking confused. I ran up the steps and almost jumped inside my house, slamming the door shut behind me. Dude, what are you running from? He asked. You, you didn't see the, see the guy chasing me? No. I ran to the window and looked outside. He was gone. I have no idea what happened to him, but I am sure that that had really happened. Whoever that guy who hissed at me was really shook me up, and I never walked down that bike path after that dark night ever again.
And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true middle-of-nowhere stories. I'd like to take a moment and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Niece. Thank you all so much for being members and supporting Back to Ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. And if you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.